circumstances, but something that the world around us doesn't understand. I've heard uh, different times already when uh, things take place that we say are, you know, that are uh, maybe accidents and so on. Uh, people ask the question, well, where's God in all of this? I uh, remember some years ago, my wife's niece and her whole family were killed in a traffic accident, father, mother, and three children. And uh, unless you've been there to a visitation and a viewing like that, it just doesn't really grip you. But anyway, uh, it made news headlines in Florida. And uh, a news reporter came out and was talking to uh, her father, my wife's brother, and uh, that was her question. Where is God in all this? And uh, my wife's brother made a statement that I haven't forgotten. He said, uh, God is at the same place he was when his son was hanging on the cross. And I uh, am thankful that he allowed that. And uh, even though we don't understand sometimes why God allows certain things to happen, I think uh, someday <clears throat> we will understand the whole picture. This evening as we uh, come to this last message here in this series, we want to say thank you for your prayer support, first of all, and also for your great hospitality and the, uh, certainly feel unworthy of the gift that you gave us. I uh, want to say thank you for that. We've had a, uh, a good, good weekend here, and uh, Titus has taken good care of us, and uh, more than we deserve. So, uh, God bless each of you, and thank you for what you've done for us. <clears throat> this evening, I felt led to uh, to preach. Maybe you'll think it's a doomsday message. I'm not sure. But for a text. Uh, I think you know the scripture in Galatians, the 6th chapter, verse 7 and 8, where it says, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. But whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. He that soweth to the flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. And he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. And this is an absolute of the word of God. He that soweth to the flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit then shall also uh, reap life everlasting. These are absolutes of the Word of God. We'd like to zero in, especially on he that soweth to the flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. You know, there are, we could, we could preach several messages on, uh, we could we preach about deception and we could preach about the, uh, those who uh, sow to the Spirit and, uh, but tonight we'd like to especially look at what happens to those who sow to the flesh and uh, take notice of that, not only for ourselves, but for the world around us. Uh, help us to maybe uh, understand and, and maybe get a, a vision of our responsibility uh, for why we're here. Sowing to the flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. Sowing to the flesh is a, uh, you know, the works of Satan and the, uh, the way that Satan works is often a progressive uh, thing. Sin is progressive in a man's life. A thief, usually his first theft is not a uh, bank holdup. And so it is in, in life. In James, the first chapter, it talks about the progression of sin. Sowing to the flesh. Let no man say in verse 13, when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempted the any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. 
Sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. You see the progression. There's a lust or a desire. And then the more we think about that, you know, action follows uh, what our mind is, is filled with. So when we follow the natural dictates of our carnal nature, that's the work of the flesh. He that soweth to the flesh shall of the flesh then reap corruption. You know, Jesus said that we are born in the flesh. I refer to that in John the third chapter, verse 6, where it says he, that uh, we are born of the flesh and we need to be born of the spirit. So since the fall of man, like I said before, man's nature has been bent toward evil. Man's nature is to a fallen nature. Uh, again, in Genesis 6, where in Noah's day, uh, God said that he seen that the imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And that's our nature. And that's what the flesh is of the works of the flesh are all about. In Galatians, the fifth chapter, it talks about the works of the flesh. It also talks about the, uh, the works of the spirit. In Galatians 5, I'd like to read from there, where it talks about in verse 17, the flesh lusts against the spirit, the spirit against the flesh. These are contrary one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. But if you be led of the spirit, you're not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. And it enumerates adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, the which I tell you before, and I've also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. That's an, that's an absolute of the word of God. He that soweth through the flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. It follows through with the same thing. Colossians, the third chapter, we read about that the other evening. Uh, you know, put off all these, anger, wrath, malice, and all of those things. These are the works of the flesh. And he that soweth through the flesh shall of that flesh reap corruption. These are absolutes. This is the law of sowing and reaping. And when you follow through with that, you know, there is going to be a reaping. He that soweth through the flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. In 1 John, the second chapter, verse 15, it says, Let us not love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. And he goes on and says, For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Again, if we sow to the flesh, we will of the flesh reap corruption. This evening I believe that all sin comes under those three categories. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life. In the beginning, when man fell, I believe it was a result of all three of those. Eve looked upon that food. She seen that it was good for food, the lust of the flesh. It was pleasant to the eyes, the lust of the eye. And it was a fruit, a tree to be desired to make one wise, the pride of life. Sin comes under those three categories. And I believe it's something that we need to be careful of. Human nature then, following after their own carnal will, like I said this morning, becomes worse and worse. Man left to himself will always gravitate toward carnality. And that's what we see in our day. I think, I'm sure that you have seen it. Uh, things as far as evil is worse in our day than it's been in time past. Uh, 
just in my lifetime, I have seen more and more of this, uh, you know, wrong, sin, evil coming through. And we see that it's getting worse and worse. Someone wrote <clears throat> about uh, the moral decay of the times. Moral, immoral anarchy has assumed extreme forms and spread through a large part of the population, side by side with an increase of immoral perversions. A shameless sexual promiscuity also greatly increased. Relations of incest has greatly increased. Adultery, rape, prostitution, has greatly increased. Homosexual love has entered by the Moors, has entered the Moors of the population. Contemporary authors seem to sadistically enjoy the enumeration of a variety of immoral perversions, unnatural sensual relations, flagellation, bestiality, sodomy. Does that sound familiar? Is that our day? I believe you would say it is. But what surprised me when I read this was that it was written 4,500 years ago about a people. In the, uh, the uh, civilization, the uh, history of the old kingdom of Egypt, and this was before Joseph's time, there was a, a historian who wrote this about the old kingdom of Egypt. It reminded me of the work of Solomon when he said there is nothing new under the sun. Evil as the world is in our day, it's not something that has not taken place before. But what happened to those nations who followed uh, in those steps, nation after nation after nation, kingdom after kingdom, followed in those steps, and they always came to the same end. And what I'm trying to teach by this this evening is that we need to learn from history. This took place. Historians tell us that virtually every great civilization through history has gone through two phases. First, there is the ascendancy, or in other words, the increase and the uh, growing stronger until it reaches the pinnacle of its power and then becomes a period of descent and finally a plunge into oblivion. This included the Canaanite kingdom. And I believe it's for this reason that Israel was commanded to totally drive out the Canaanites from the land of Canaan when they took it over. The archaeologists have dug up things from that era, and they say the Canaanites were some of the, the most perverted people that there was. I mean, with the, the uh, the little idols that they would have had of their false gods. They had a perversion of sensuality. The Middle Kingdom of Egypt, the Old Kingdom of Egypt, and that was uh, what this, at the time of this man that wrote what he did that I just read. And then the Middle Kingdom of Egypt, which would have been in Joseph's day. And then the uh, Babylonian and Assyrian kingdoms, the Medo-Persian Empire, these were in Daniel's day. All of these great empires, the Greek Empire and then the Roman Empire, uh, which was in place in Jesus' day, all of these empires had, uh, had this, this thing in common. During periods of the ascendancy, every one of these nations and kingdoms adhered to periods 
of moral restriction, even laws enforcing it. And because of this, the people grew strong and their nations prospered. There was moral restrictions. People were concerned about the moral depravity of uh, the bent of man. People grew strong, their nations prospered. After reaching prosperity and success, the moral codes were relaxed, ignored, finally done away with, and the people began to enter sensual freedom, immorality, promiscuity, and the nation plunged into the sea of oblivion, one after another. And this statement is what really shook me. This happened to every nation of antiquity without exception. God's word is true. He that sowed through the flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. Where are we at in this nation? I asked a question in the beginning after I read what this man wrote. Does that sound familiar? Now, some of you nodded your heads, and I agree. I believe we see that in our day. That type of life and lifestyle, it's called, you know, an uh, alternative lifestyle, but in reality, it's sin, as far as God is concerned. And I believe there's a region, you know, I believe it's important that we learn from, from uh, that from history. In Romans, the, the first chapter, it teaches us, I believe, what happened or what's happening in, in nations like that. Romans chapter 1, I would like to break in here in verse 21. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened, professing themselves to become what? To be wise, they became fools, and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and the birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Wherefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts, to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped the, and served the creature more than the creator. That was one of the reasons this morning that I especially emphasized the importance of nonconformity in the nutshell when we are careful that we do not draw attention to the creature more than the creator. For this cause, God gave them up into vile affections for even their women to change the natural use into that which is against nature. Likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another, men with men, working that which is unseemly, and receiving to themselves that recompense of their error which was meet. And when, even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not, be, are not convenient, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whispers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, in other words, never satisfied, who knowing the judgment of God that they which commit such things are worthy of death not only do the same but have pleasure in them that do them. And I believe this is a fulfillment of this scripture when a nation deliberately walks away from God, does not want to have anything to do with God, think they are so smart that they can handle it all themselves. And then they become perverted in their in their ways. <clears throat> in our time, in my time, I have seen 
this gradual descent. There was a time when uh, there was a concern about the moral lives of people. The way that people were dressed was uh, a concern. If there would have been a person, uh, my dad talks about the times when there was a, a woman walking on the beach in Florida who uh, exposed more than her ankles and she was arrested. Now that's, that's been within the last hundred years. And you see the, the gradual descent. And in our day, in my day, as a young person, uh, much of this attitude changed. Uh, before that, before the 1960s, uh, there was a moral code that most people uh, adhered to. You know, uh, adultery was something that was, I remember when Ronald Reagan was in, uh, running for office, and he was, he had his second wife. He was divorced and remarried. And there were people who, who spoke out against that. We can't have a man that's in adultery as a president. Now, as far as presidents go, I believe he was a good president, as far as politics is concerned. But that was the, the emphasis. And, you know, when, when there was uh, fornication and children born out of wedlock, you know, it was a shame. During the 1960s, people, young people especially, rebelled against those moral restrictions. And the hippie movement started. That was in, in our day, in my day. And uh, I'm sure the older brother Freeman here, you remember those days as well. The hippie movement and how that uh, you know, what that was, was young people from middle and upper class society rebelling against the moral restrictions of their day. And they decided that instead of going and getting a haircut when dad says, I'm going to let my hair grow. And they're going to be long and straggly. And the people just, I mean, it was anything went. Uh, there was, we're going to be free. And we're going to show that we're going to be free. And so we, we no longer wear clothing that uh, is matched and looks decent. But wearing mismatched clothing was the end thing. And especially something that was plastered with flowers. And uh, like I said, the hippie movement came along and people uh, they wanted to have free love. They wanted to have, you know, just live one day at a time, have peace. And uh, everybody just uh, love each other. And, and uh, there was a lot of uh, hand to mouth. You know, that's when men started wearing flip flops and uh, long straggly hair, unkept, and women uh, dressed about the same way. And uh, as time went on, uh, they would, uh, you know, float around from one place to another. The, uh, the little VW bus was a real in thing. And usually it had flowers painted all over it, you know, flower power. And that's where the, the V sign came in. Uh, victory and peace. About the same time, the use of drugs came along. About the same time, there was the, uh, the uh, rock music that came along. Rock music, you know, is a rebellious music, really, and it teaches rebellion. So, <clears throat> with all of that, and then the Vietnam War, came along, a war that uh, made no sense, and people, young people especially, rebelled against that, and 
uh, decided that that was not a reasonable war, no wars are as far as that's concerned, but uh, in their mind this was a, a dead end street and it was something they were not going to be involved in. And so, you know, at that time we had a card, a draft card that gave us our, our uh, what our, our qualifications were if you were a 1W, or a 1, if you were a conscientious objector, your card was 1W, and if you were not, it was 1A, uh, military. And so uh, some of these young people would uh, deliberately take their draft cards and light them and burn them. They would take the American flag and literally, deliberately burn it. Riots broke out in Kent State University. The riot became so bad that the National Guard was called in. And they rebelled against the National Guard so much that they were in fear of their lives. And they shot into the student body, killing six people, wounding others. And all the nation was upset and in a turmoil during all of this. But then they had these conventions, hippie conventions, where rock music was free, drug abuse was free, free love. There was a hippie convention in, in one of the states, I forget which state it was in, where uh, they were out in the field, didn't have tents, camped out there for over a week, and it rained almost every day. Can you imagine thousands of people in a big field, even though it was a hay field, what that looked like after about three or four days of stumping around there and it's constantly raining. People, did, you know, they abandoned their clothing and were out there in that soup and in that mess. Free love, drug abuse, and all of that stuff combined, you know, they looked like pigs when they came out of there. Smelled like it too. That was in our day. And from that time on, there has been a descendance of moral issues. People have held on to that philosophy. Along with that came the uh, teachings of how to teach your children. Dr. Spock was one who was uh, supposedly a, a uh, one who knew how to, to teach and to train children. His idea was that if you use the rod of correction, it will ruin a child's self-esteem. And a lot of other anti-scriptural philosophy that was uh, given at that time. Someone has written, we have produced a whole generation of little monsters that cause a nation to cringe behind triple locked doors and barred windows, afraid to go out because people have learned, have not learned to discipline their urges. So we have rape, murder, slavery, etc. Now, do we learn from history? in relation to the other nations that we talked about. Where is this nation in time frame? I believe that's something that we need to think about and be conscious of. There is a, an absolute of the Word of God. The Word of God says, whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. He that saw it to the flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. I don't believe this nation is any better than any other one that I referred to. And every one of those nations without fail ended up in oblivion, as it were, because of their depraved nature. And this nation is headed the same direction. Jesus said, you are the light of the world. He also said, you are salt of the earth. But if the salt have lost its savor, it is henceforth good for nothing, 
but to be cast out and to be trodden under the foot of men. I believe that it's very possible that this nation will be trodden under the foot of men. So, are we then doomed? Is there no hope? And it sounds like it, doesn't it? But I believe there is hope. But it's going to be because that Christians are diligent about their responsibilities. In 2 Corinthians, the 5th chapter, verse 17, is also another absolute. It says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things have passed away, and behold, all things have become new. We talk about the works of the flesh, but there are also works of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against us there is no law. Beloved, this evening, the only remedy for this nation, that it will not go the direction of other nations, is if people will become born again and become children of God. And when they are led by the Spirit of God, they will abandon their vile affections and lifestyles. That's the only remedy. And beloved, you and I have a responsibility to make it happen. And that's what God wants of us. He wants us to be diligent in being a witness and a testimony, helping these people to change from their vile affections. And instead of being so repulsed by all of the tattoos and all of the piercings and all of that of these people, we need to recognize they have a soul. And beloved, we need to love them enough to open a conversation with them too. <laughs> That's what I feel like doing. Is, you know, some of this stuff is so evil. But I believe God would have us as his children. You have enough love for these people that we will help them to see what God wants them to be. And again, I say it's your only hope for this nation. We're not any better, better than anybody else. And when we fall to a certain point, I believe God is going to bring judgment on this nation. We need to get our priorities straight. Instead of focusing on accumulating wealth and things, we need to be satisfied Having food and raiment, the Bible says uh, we should be content. Now, I believe it's important that if, if God has blessed us with the ability to, to make money, I don't think we should just sit around as soon as we have enough to, uh, you know, <clears throat> to have food and raiment for ourselves. That's fine, but the scripture also teaches that we should work so that we have to give to those who are in need. If God has blessed us with the ability to make money, I believe we need to keep on making it, but use it for the honor and glory of God instead of just accumulating it for ourselves. I believe God has a work for us. I believe it should be our goal to help people to become children of God. If our priority is wealth and accumulation, if this nation goes under, Think we'll be able to keep those things? Time and time again, it's been proven. You know, when those other nations uh, went under and were overtaken by other nations, you know, the things that men had accumulated was, they couldn't keep it. And so I believe it's important that we use these things that God has given us for his glory. I think it's important this evening, my friends, that we take seriously Jesus' command, that great commission, that as you go, go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. Lo, I am with you all the way, even unto the end of the world. As you go, that should be our goal, my friend. Granted, we need to make a living. Granted, we have a you know, we have children and, and family to support. But I believe it's, that our goal should be the same as Jesus' goal was for his disciples. Brother Freeman talked to us yesterday evening about mending those nets. And I was encouraged and challenged 
I was blessed with uh, the thought uh, in that scripture, Jesus called these men and immediately they left their nets. What was Jesus' mandate for these men? What was his calling? Jesus said, come, I will make you fishers of men. And that's his calling for every child of his. God has called you and I to be fishers of men. Are we fishing? I believe we should be. God has called us for that. <clears throat> there was a man, a mathematician, an engineer back before the days of Jesus. Archimedes was his name, he was born in 288 AD. And uh, he was a man that was really before his time, as it were. He was a, a brilliant man. Mathematics was just a, a passion that he had. He just loved to figure things out. Uh, you know, figuring out the circumference, the, uh, the area of a circle. You take... Uh, Radius squared times what? Pi. Archimedes figured out pi. But his main thing was uh, the making work easier for people. And uh, he came up with the idea and taught in seminars how much easier it is to uh, move things with a lever. And so uh, this was his principle. He, uh, this is called a fulcrum. And then he would have a, a big weight here. Let's say this is a thousand pounds. And this uh, bar here, lever, Say it's 10 feet long. How much pressure does it take pushing down on that lever to move that thousand pounds? 100 pounds. So you and I could uh, move that thousand pounds with a 10 foot lever. And uh, he had seminars and, and meetings where he taught these people about those things. He also taught them about the inclined plane, which is a screw. But the reason I'm bringing this in, he made a statement that I'd like to get a hold of. He made a statement, he said, with a lever, I could move the world if I had a place to stand. And below this evening, I believe that you and I have a place to stand. We have a lever as well. And I believe God has given us the responsibility of moving the world as it were. Not the whole world at one time, but one at a time. And I believe that's our calling and our responsibility. We haven't been called to change the whole world, but we have been called to change one at a time or to allow, teach them so that God can change them. I, you know, I could move the world if I had a place to stand. In Acts 1 8, it says, But you shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and she shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem, in all of Judea, in Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. That's what Jesus told the disciples just before he left. And we see how seriously they took him on that. When the Holy Ghost came on the day of Pentecost in Acts the second chapter, we have that account. And you remember how that when the Holy Ghost came upon them and how that uh, Peter, you know, that, that man who, who often got his foot in his mouth, but when the Holy Ghost came upon him, he preached a powerful message. And it was so powerful that men uh, became convicted and they said, uh, you know, they were pierced in their heart. They said, Men brother, what shall we do? And Peter said, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins. 
and 3,000 repented. Later, him and uh, Peter and John went up to the temple, and there was a lame man there, and he was expecting alms, and Peter said, uh, he said, silver and gold have I none, but such as I give thee in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And all this is a wonderful thing. And the people gathered together, and Peter again took the opportunity to preach the message. And as a result of that, 5,000 people responded to the gospel. Ye shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses. Beloved, this evening I told you this morning that it's important. It's imperative that if we are going to be children of God, in order to be children of God, we must be filled with the Spirit. Are we fulfilling our God-given responsibility then in reaching out and teaching others? Granted, I, I know, you know, you say, well, I can't talk. I'm not a preacher. You don't have to be a preacher to be a witness. Just your daily life, and we'll look at that a little bit later, Paul and Silas, in Acts the 16th chapter, you know that story. How that they healed a girl of her demonic possession, and as a result of that were thrown into a prison. And uh, how, how that the, uh, the, they were escaped that prison because of that earthquake, and the Philippian jailer was converted. Later they went on to Thessalonica, and uh, the Jews uh, when came down and uh, they tried to stir up the people and this is what they said about them. They said, these that have turned the world upside down have come hither also. Have you turned the world upside down? Really, they were turning it right side up, I believe. But that's the calling. They took that calling seriously. Are you and I taking that calling seriously? They said, well, I can't speak well. I, uh, There was a man once who uh, was ordained. My wife and I knew him. And when he was ordained, he, uh, he just bemoaned the fact. He said, I, I don't know why God chose me. He said, I can't speak. I can't. So he went to an old bishop and he said, uh, Brother, he said, I, I think God made a mistake. I can't. I'm not a speaker. I can't preach. And the old bishop brother, he said, Well, brother, just remember, God made a donkey talk one time. I think he can take care of you. If that's your idea that, uh, you know, I can't speak, I believe God will give you the words to say, and it, it's often, it doesn't take a lot of words to be a genuine witness. There was a man in our community. He had very little to say. If you went to their house, you had to do all the talking uh, pretty well. He would sit and listen. But he was a, a man who did roofing. Uh, he's passed on to his reward years, quite a few years ago. Moved out of our community more years than that. But there's another one of the brethren in the congregation that did roofing, and he would, you know, 20 some years later, he would, uh, they would call this brother to come and redo the roof. And invariably, they always had a testimony for that brother. He was a, you know, he did what he said he was going to do, and he was just such an outstanding man. He left a testimony without saying a whole lot. And I believe you and I can too. You know, what is our testimony? I believe we can be a witness. Uh, in, if God gives us the ability to speak and to relate to people, praise the Lord. If he doesn't, the life that we live, I believe, is going to be a real witness and testimony. And the sisters, you know, I believe they have that responsibility as well. Well, but, you know, I can't go out and witness. You know, after all, I've got all these little children to take care of. Do you realize that even as you teach your children, that's a testimony? There was a man in our community who told me one time, he said, my mama says, she wishes all of our women in our church would have their children trained as well as your women do. She even said she thinks that uh, maybe it'd be good if they would have 
a class and some of our women would come and teach them how to train their children. Says when your children are in, in the grocery store, they're respectful. They're not running up and down the aisle, throwing a fit and having temper tantrums and grabbing stuff off the shelves and throwing it around like all the, a lot of the other children are. People notice that. Just even how you train your children is a testimony to witness. And one of the crying needs that I hear of today is dependable help. You know, business people, that's a cry that I hear from all of them. I can't find any dependable help. One man even said, I think we're going to have to change the genetics of these young children. I said, what do you mean? They need four hands. I said, well, why? He said, well, they need one to hold a cell phone, the other to hold their pants up and two to work. <laughs> That's too, too much the way it is. If you've ever hired people from the public, you know what you know what he's talking about. I had a man stacking lumber for me behind a sawmill, and he was trying to do it with one hand, the other hand uh, having a, a cell phone in his hand texting his girlfriend. I finally told him, I said, "That ain't gonna work. You know, he got behind it and slowed the whole process down." I said, "Let's put the cell phone in the break room if you want to." text her at break time, that's fine, that's on your time. But I said, uh, when you're working, you're stealing time from us. And uh, dependable workforce, you know, being work ethics, I believe it's something that we need to teach our children. And it is a testimony, a witness to the world around us. They marvel at that. Teaching our young men to take their responsibility in being a witness, being a testimony. That is even, you know, having devotion. That is something that stands out. We have a jail ministry. And uh, the young men who are 18 years and older uh, can be a part of that as well. And are. You know, it's a little bit uneasy, even for us older ones to go into a prison, you have three sets of locked doors behind you, and then here you have prisoners who uh, are criminals, I mean, after all, they've killed somebody and all of that, and they come out and they want to have a, a worship service, and you're in there right there with them. And then you have these young men, 18 years old, uh, come in the, for the first time and uh, and then maybe the second time or so they have a, a devotional. And I've seen literally some of those young men, you know, their knees are shaking a little bit behind that podium. And, uh, you know, it was interesting, the prisoner noticed that too. And one of the prisoners told me one time, he said, uh, you know, you older man, you come in here, he said, I appreciate you coming. But he said, uh, you're supposed to be uh, genuine. You're supposed to be Christian. He said, what really speaks to us is when those young men come in here and they stand up here and they have a devotional from the Word of God. He said, that just speaks to our hearts. So young men, you've got a privilege and a blessing by being faithful. That speaks loud. You don't have to say a whole lot. But just living a consistent Christian life as a young person is something that the world notices. And many young people today would like to be a part of that. To the changing, I believe we have work to do. Again, I would like to remind us that Jesus said that we should teach. He gave us that great commission. Again, it's the only hope for this nation, the scripture is still the same. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. But to every man soweth, that shall he also reap. He that soweth to the flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. That's an absolute. But along with that, he that soweth to the spirit shall of the spirit reap life everlasting. 
and let's do our part. And maybe this nation can be spared from going into oblivion, from being overtaken under the foot of man. But we have a work to do. Let's kneel in prayer. Thank you, Lord, again for your blessing to us. Thank you for the privilege that we have to be your children. Thank you for the privilege that we have to lead others to that way. Help us, Lord, to be faithful. Lord, so many times we get strings attached to this old world. We just pray, Father, that you would help us that we might be otherworldly minded. And help us to be faithful in the work you've called us to. Thank you for the ability to provide for our family. But help us, Lord, not to focus on those things, but to focus on those things that are eternal. Bless each one here. Father, guide them as they serve you here in this community. Help them, Lord, to have zeal that will bring others to your kingdom. We recognize, Lord, this is your work. And that's what you would have us to do. So bless us, we pray in Jesus' name. tonight. Sowing and reaping. Reaping to the flesh, or sowing to the flesh, reaping corruption. Sowing to the spirit, reap life everlasting. Vast difference between the two outcomes. Corruption, death. Spirit is life. Trust that we can get a vision. I had to think of the verse that we lay up our traitors in heaven. I think that's what we heard tonight. Trying to lay up pleasures and treasures for self and carnal sins of the flesh or death. But seeking to be a witness and a builder of the kingdom of God is life. Not only for ourselves, but we trust that we can take others with us to glory. Plus, with that challenge of very fitting message for the last evening that we think about the consequences of what we sow every day. It has eternal consequences. Just thank God for the message tonight. I'd like to open up for anyone else to share whatever the Lord is in your heart. I'd like to say amen to the message that has blessed me here tonight. Yes, when uh, the LJ started telling us of the corruption of the world, I was like, know this, what, what, where are you going? And I uh, appreciate, you know, that sometimes we need to be pointed in that direction that we, we're told, you know, even though we know what's out there, that we don't, that we realize our part is to grab hold of that lever and move that, that little, you know, that rock or whatever. Do, do a, maybe it's just a little bit, but do what we can.
say you give your heart to the Lord. And I, I just appreciate it. That, you know, it, it's not just nation. It comes right down to us individuals, how, how we're doing. Are we coming? going to the Lord or are we just falling and going down, down, down? Amen to that. close of this service, we again thank you for your many blessings to us. Lord, tonight, as we heard about sowing and reaping, help us, Lord, that we can be mindful that what we sow, we do reap, and that our lives are eternal. We will be somewhere forever. So, Lord, help us to make our calling of action sure, laying up treasures in heaven, not only for ourselves, but for others as well. Lord, that we can be a vessel that you can use to bring others into the fold. We can be that witness as we go from day to day that our our daily walk of life could draw people to you and to your own ways. So Lord, part us with your blessing. Bless brother, bless brother LJ and sister Rosemary as they go back home. Protect them as they go on the highways tomorrow and also in the days ahead. May thy blessing rest upon them and grant them thy direction and leading as they go on through life. Bless the church there for sharing them with us. And Lord, may your will be accomplished in us and through us as we continue on through life. In Jesus we pray. Amen.